this is a recording for the um, Equality to Excellence chapter, and which is a complicated chapter, has a lot of information, so I'm going to try to uh, narrow things down to some, you know, kind of key points here. Um, and the overall, the, sort of the overarching goal be that you guys become familiar with uh, policy over the last uh, 30, 40 years, um, and understand sort of, you know, the different ways um, policy has, has impacted education, and then um, to see some like related contemporary issues, because basically, and what Urban says in the chapter is there's more continuity than discontinuity, I and mean, what he means by that is that things have been really just kind of like building for the last 30 years, and there's been a lot of similarities in the rhetoric and kind of things that have happened um, that have influenced the education. One example would be um, the account quote like accountability movement, which is um, wrapped up in testing and you know sort of gave birth to No Child Left Behind. Um, so we'll see the way that that trajectory kind of happened and those things um, developed. And then I think the most impactful issues affecting education today um, are kind of covered through this piece, like school choice vouchers, um, the sort of back to basics. Um, push and then um, teacher certification or professionalization um, and what other questions um, I just I always use this as a you know to kind of note the importance of um, this chapter to make it clear to teachers how important it is to vote and be engaged in um, you know voting and to be aware of politics and uh, in the last um, election you know it was a very kind of complicated sort of outcome. But uh, I wanted to mention teachers, a number of teachers ran around the country for political office. And uh, in um, Wisconsin, Scott Walker, uh, who's on the left, or if you're facing it, basically on the left there, um, was disliked by teachers. He had, he had um, sort of attacked the teachers union. And, um, and uh, at least I think most teachers um, in Wisconsin disliked him. Um, and the individual on the right, and I'm spacing out on his name right now, was a teacher in Wisconsin who worked his way up to become a principal, worked his way up to become a superintendent, um, and eventually became the uh, superintendent of public instruction. So the, you know, basically the secretary of education for the state of Wisconsin. And then he ran for governor against Scott Walker and, and won. And he won um, running on a, on a primar primarily an education uh, platform. Um, so again, I, I would just really encourage you guys to be sort of aware of different people running and, and um, their policies and what they're proposing. Um, where our um, sort of chapter begins here is with Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan is, is incredibly highly regarded um, on, on, you know, on the right in our political system um, for his contribution. Um, and I think that even though he didn't get a lot of things necessarily enacted during his time in office, what, what I'll show you and try to make an argument for is that he really changed the discussion on a number of issues and changed the way we think about issues um, through the 20th century. One example I always give in class is welfare. And if I ask students if it has a negative or positive connotation, they, everybody says negative. And when I ask people from different countries, like when I've talked to students in Pakistan and ask them about welfare, they say it has a very positive connotation. It's about taking care of people. And so when I try to use that to explain the differences in how you know people in the United States see things very differently sometimes, um, by the way things have been framed or the connections that people make with things, um, you know, that kind of helps sort of explain it. And that, that was something that Reagan, for example, really changed the conversation on wealth, public welfare. And I think a primary issue from this time period, from Reagan to the contemporary time period, is the shift from seeing anything private as good and public really as inferior or as inherently um, less, uh, I don't know, sort of like less um, stable or, or organized or, or those kinds of things. And I'm going to give you an example of that. Um, so the shift that happens from equality to excellence here is the shift from a focus on individual equality or one equality as a principle, and you see that in areas like segregation, um, to excellence, which is, I think, a very individualistic kind of focus, individual competition. 
um, the focus has gone from equality to individual competition. And you kind of, if you know this time period, I mean, from the 1960s and 70s with hippies and stuff like that, I mean, you know, from that shift to one of more individual competitiveness. Um, what really kind of fosters this or drives this in the realm of education is Sputnik. That's something I wanted you to be familiar with. Um, that was the first satellite launched into space by the Soviet Union. It created a wave of, of fear and, and um, concern in the United States. And education dramatically changed um, pre and post Sputnik. Um, one of the examples that I wanted to give that's covered in the chapter is the growth of um, student loans and the diminishment of um, public, public, and that comes from the decline in in state and public support for uh, university education. And I'll often, when I teach this in class, I'll, I'll ask students like, how, and it, as a trick question, how much was the University of California system in the, in the 1960s, 70s. And, you know, people take guesses. Well, it was actually free. Um, it didn't cost you anything to go. If you got admitted to the University of California system, it was free. Um, and places like the University of Texas was a dollar a credit. Um, public institutions were very, very affordable through the 1970s. Ronald Reagan introduced the tuition system into the University of California system in the 1980s. And if you're not aware now, at this point, I mean, to go to one of the UC campuses generally is around 30, 30 to $40,000 a year. Um, so it's gone up massively and ma way outpaced all other forms of, of um, you know, inflation. And, um, and uh, you can kind of see the debt, student debt grow has grown in relation. And so what he talks, Urban talks about in the chapter is, you know, each year it would be like, you know, politicians would cut Pell Grants and other forms of assistance that would generally go to um, students for college, and they would replace them with loans. Um, and that's happened again throughout. Um, I, th I think it has a major um, impact on, um, on students. Um, and you can look here at Ball State too. Like in the 1970s, um, it was around $500 a year to go to school here. And if you adjust that for inflation, that would be a few thousand dollars, or a little under $3,000. And so, you know, most students, again, through that time period and in, in up and through the 1980s, you know, could, could work a summer job and afford to pay, you know, or could pay for college. And even up into the year 2000, Ball State tuition was about thirty-seven, you know, hundred dollars, around three thousand seven hundred. So it's gone up a little bit since, you know, adjusted for inflation, but not dramatically. But since that time period, um, you know, since the year two thousand, it's just spiked and gone up dramatically. Um, and again, the primary reason for that is the decline in state support um, for for you know the the lessening of state dollars for higher education. Um, sometimes people point to other things that are relevant, the growth of education and other things, but um, that's kind of the primary thing. And, and again, that, that I think that shows the shift in perception that's happened where education is seen as, you know, it used to be that education was seen as a, as a, as a social good. So we invest in education because it helps society, it, it, it's, it's positive, you know, to have an educated workforce and things like that. Um, it's a social good. To today, I think it's seen much more as a private like commodity. Um, even public schools often are, it's, it, the, you know, it's like I buy a nice home so I can live in a nice neighborhood, so I can send my kids to a nice school so that they can get a degree, that they can go and get a good job, so they can live in a nice neighborhood, so they can send their kids. It, it's 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 just seen in a different way um, today than it was previously, um, and and I think a lot of the rhetoric of Reagan is really kind of behind that. And he would say things like, um, you know, why should a truck driver um, pay for the you know the education of a doctor, which is a you know on one level compelling, but on the other level, you know, what if the truck driver has a kid who wants to be a doctor, or, or you know, our society needs doctors, right? So. It's, it's, it's a bit more complicated, I think, but, um, you know, and, yeah, 
we could have a whole discussion about that, but I'm not sure that what people are saying today is tuition-free college is the right way to go. We've expanded uh, access dramatically to, pu to public education or to higher education. Um, but at the same time, too, we've just gone, the pendulum has gone really, really far in one direction, um, in my opinion. Um, again, away from being a social good to being a private commodity. Um, Reagan had three primary objectives when he came into office. It was to abolish the Department of Education, um, get rid of it, um, tax credit for private school children, and then returning private um, prayer to school. And I want to talk a little bit about the Department of Education. Um, and again, I've, I've worked with um, the department um, in the past previously. Um, I think there's a lot of really good people that work there. It's by far the smallest uh, department in terms of its budget and the number of people who work there. Um, so this is kind of a graph. And you can see that education is around generally around $70 billion, uh, a year. But if you look at defense spending, and that's gone up. This is outdated. This is 2011. I mean, defense today is well over um, 740, I think now, 740 billion. Um, and then you can see, like, you might think, well, of course we want to take care of, um, you know, veterans and stuff like that. But the Veterans Affairs Office is a whole other budget, and that's 100, around 130 billion. Um, education, I think, has gone up a little bit to around 74 billion. Um, but uh, Tr Trump, President Trump, ran on. Uh, abolishing the Department of Education. So he's um, he wants to get rid of it as well. Um, and to date, he hasn't really made any um, specific moves to do that. He has cut the budget. And um, if you have been following the news, you'll know that he cut. And the, the thing is, is when you start cutting the Department of Ed budget, there are all things that like no one wants to get rid of. And that's why I think it's almost – because things like Special Olympics, that was the big thing that – Trump had a major issue over. Um, he had cut the uh, budget for Special Olympics and some other programs. But I mean, the programs from the Department of Ed are things like uh, Title I, the free and reduced lunch program for kids in poverty. And even Republican senators and Congress people, when, when faced with that reality, you know, don't support those decisions. Or things like cutting, you know, the department or uh, Special Olympics, which has a small budget, does most of the money through fundraising, and most people regard as a very positive um, program. Um, so you can just kind of see the, the scale here. Um, and I just wish people had a better idea of what the Department of Ed does. And their primary function is actually overseeing student loans. That's the primary thing the Department of Education does. Um, and then in addition to student loans, the other thing would be like Title I, like I mentioned, and then programs for kids with special needs, um, all the IDEA grants, um, things like that. And then Pell Grants are part of the um, you know, college. Um, and um, President Trump, I, I believe, cut Pell Grants um, as well. So. And yeah, you can pretty much see. Um, I like to always point out one of the things and I'll just kind of mention to you guys as an extra credit question. There'll be a question about who the Secretary of Education is for the final. And um, Betsy DeVos is our um, current Secretary of Education. Um, she's very unlike any previous one. Um, the Secretaries of Education have all been like generally like people in education, state superintendents or you know people who've been in charge of education for a state traditionally. And I think a few like governors or other – People, but people with administrative experience. Betsy DeVos is an heiress. I mean, she inherited a lot of money. Her two, she's the product of two wealthy families that came together um, with fortunes. So she was born born a billionaire and um, has no degree in education, no experience in education, you know, in working in schools or anything. Um, she has been a, a part of a nonprofit that really pushes for um, school choice. Um, and... Um, yeah, we can talk a little more about her. Hopefully some of you guys are vaguely familiar with her, or know about her at least, or familiar with her. Um, so it was kind of Terrell Bell who was Secretary of Education for um, Ronald Reagan. And he came from Utah, conservative, but he managed to save the Department of Ed. I, I think he saw value in it and, um, and saved it. So I want, also want you to know that 
uh, a nation at risk was uh, Ronald Reagan's education um, policy. Uh, he promoted school choice, and we'll get we'll get into these things when we get back. Um, so let me run through these really quickly, and then I'll, I'll kind of go through them in a little more depth. Ronald Reagan, the name of the policy was a nation at risk. George H. W. Bush is America 2000. Uh, William uh, Jefferson Clinton was Goals 2000, and then. George W. Bush, you guys should know, that was No Child Left Behind. Um, Ronald Reagan focused on a lot of things like back to the basics. Um, you know, we already talked about a few of them, school choice. Um, he didn't really have a major impact in terms of outcomes. And that's because, and, and we'll kind of see with the first three here that, and you don't need to remember these, but historical things generally have interrupted a focus on education. For Reagan, it was... Um, you know, he had an Iran Contra and a number of different things. Um, you know, the, the 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 issues with the Soviet Union, and then George H. W. Bush with the collapse of the Soviet Union, and uh, the first Gulf War, and um, some other issues. Um, for America 2000, in the reading, you'll notice they have a bunch of. It had like uh, I think eight or eight or ten goals that are really like overly exaggerated like um all you know america will be number one in math and science schools will be drug free every kid will come you know being able to read you don't need to memorize those what i want you to know is that they were unrealistic goals there was no way to achieve them i mean he didn't you know they didn't outline a way to achieve those goals they didn't put funding behind it um they, no pathway or anything it was really just seen as more of a political stunt um, but what, what J J George H. W. Bush did promote, in addition to the school choice and other things that Reagan had promoted, prayer in schools, things like that, um, he also pushed voluntary testing programs. This is where you get the start of like um, testing for accountability, um, but it was voluntary at that time. Uh, and then he pushed um, alternative paths to teacher certification. We'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. Uh, Bill Clinton basically took George uh, George Bush's policy and then just put two more goals to it. He just put parental involvement and uh, teacher training. Um, so not a lot really shifted or changed. And for Bill, Bill Clinton, the, the historical context was, of course, like the Republican, there was a wave and they overtook the um, Senate and the Congress. And so not a lot uh, really got passed. And... Um, um, and Bill Clinton really continued a lot of the same things of George H.W. Bush, like the voluntary testing, um, accountability, and some of the things like that. And, um, yeah, so limited impact. George H.W. Bush is where things uh, changed dramatically. And, of course, here we're talking about federal involvement. Um, and this is no child left behind. And this is where we get mandated testing. Um, the Constitution forbids uh, the, the federal government from controlling education in America. That's a kind of complex dynamic in our country. But what the federal government can now do is uh, withhold money or funding. And so even though less than 9% comes from the federal government, most money for um, state education comes from property taxes but um, or state funding. But um, George W. Bush uh, used that power. Like states would lose funds if they um, didn't uh, adhere to testing. And so it was very punitive and things like that. We'll talk a little bit about No Child Left Behind. All right, I'm going to go through these next slides pretty quickly. Um, uh, a Nation at Risk was signed in Indiana, uh, so it was signed here. Um, it had a very ominous tone, like things were falling apart. Everything was uh, you know, um, a crisis. Um, Every, everything was about preparing kids for the economy. Um, that's important to know, that the primary focus was preparing kids for the economy. I don't think that's an inherently bad idea. Like, I get why people do that, but I, I just think, like, we're in this weird space today where by the time a kid enters school, by the time they leave school, the workforce has changed so dramatically. Um, it's just not a feasible goal anymore in my, you know, kind of mind. Uh, there was a lot of like back to the basics. Um, I also ask you a question. This is from David Berliner, um, who we talked about last week. Um, he looked at the data 
used in a nation at risk. And if you kind of look here, this is the NAEP scores. Now, the NAEP is a common test where we sample students from around the United States to see how they're doing. There was a bit of a dip around the 1980s here. But you can see that it levels out or corrects itself here um, in math, science, and reading. What, what David Bernerliner also pointed out was this dip occurred um, because uh, more kids were actually entering and staying in high school, which is obviously a positive thing, but it, it created a, a short dip kind of here. And basically what A Nation at Risk did was cherry pick data to create a crisis. Um, and so he called it, um, there, there was no dramatic decline in performance. That's what's important to him. And a lot of people do that. They, you know, they beat up on schools back to promote their ideas. Um, again, cultural literacy, just to know, like a, a focus on um, sort of essentialism or back to the, you know, basics, um, a sort of narrowing of the curriculum. Um, we're going to get into school choice. Um, and testing. These are the goals I told you about. Um, again, that they were unrealistic and unfulfilled. Um, Bill Clinton. I always use that picture because it's like the slimiest <laughs> picture of him I could find. Um, he did improve relationships with um, teachers uh, pretty dramatically. Um, but, but other than that, little impact. And then, of course, No Child Left Behind was a dramatic. Um, accountability, punishing schools that didn't meet proficiency levels. And it, there was some, maybe some well-intentioned aspects of No Child Left Behind, but overall everything was inherently problematic. N nobody ended up liking No Child Left Behind. I mean, conservatives ended up hating it um, because it was this huge federal intrusion into you know, local education. Um, people on the left hated it because it punished students and it had all these negative consequences. Um, I always worry that, that for you guys, like most students that I have now are basically products. Like they've grown up in, you know, schools in this era, and that's kind of like all people know. But school education was dramatically different um, prior to No Child Left Behind. Way more autonomy and flexibility for teachers. Um, and I think now it's, it's hard because you still want to maybe make sure that states don't ignore certain groups of students, you know, like they did prior to No Child Left Behind, but to do it in a, in a better way would be, you know, positive. Um, so high stakes testing and accountability, public reporting. Um, so I'm not going to go too in depth here. I'm, I really, really want you to watch the um, video on school vouchers in Indiana, because it is in Indiana. It's Fort Wayne. And I, I, it'll help you to much better understand what a voucher is and what it does. Um, I, I am my uh, neighbor is Steve Edwards, who's the um, emergency manager for Muncie Community Schools. He's kind of the acting superintendent right now. And you know, we talk and I talk to other leaders, and they're always aware that charter schools and vouchers and other factors are really, really impacting public education in the state. Um, and, and when you talk to them about it, like that, those are some of the biggest factors really impacting um, education today. Now, there are two ways, I think, to look at vouchers. One is somewhat of a looking at individual families and, you know, feeling very this compelling desire to, you know, to give the kid, the, the family money, a voucher, in a sense, to go to a private school and, and things like that. But when you, I think when you pan out and you look at a broader level, what happens is that ends up, you know, Muncie is a good example because it, it, it's, it's a city that, that has a system that's set up for, you know, 80, you know, 80, 90,000 people or whatever, in, you know, in the community. You need transportation. So a public school needs transportation. They need special education services. Uh, all the things that private schools don't need. So when you take the money from a public school and you give it to a private school, uh, you know, in a community like Muncie, well, if you have 80,000 students, you assume, or, you know, whatever it is Muncie ha should have, 30,000 students, so many of those kids are going to have special needs. So many of those kids are going to have, um, and, and normally you can offset that cost by having a large population. Well, when you 
peel off that population and you send it to charter schools and private schools and you take that money away or to surrounding districts, the 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 district ends up really suffering. And that that's really a big part of what's happening in Muncie. Um, and, and what the problems are. Um, some people worry too, I mean, you know, the religion issue is a part of vouchers as well. Um, the Supreme Court, both at the Indiana level and at the federal level, have said that it doesn't violate, uh, vouchers do not violate the freedom of religion because parents make the decision of where to send their kid. I do always worry, wonder if like a bunch of madrasas or something started popping up and collecting voucher money. Um, how right now because they're primarily Christian schools um, and you know um, it, it's not a big as big of an issue um, I will say though that I, and this is kind of a personal point I, I do think that the the church sex scandal and some of the other issues have really hurt uh, you know you know churches and um, People maybe not so much in Indiana, but in other parts of the country, have been less maybe interested in sending their their, their children to those places. But um, and I think that what what then people have done, politicians have have offset that impact by really pushing voucher programs. And I think one of the problems too that I would just say is that I, I feel like vouchers um, if should be voted on. Uh, and I I wish like in places like Indiana, there's never been. You know, there's never been a voucher system that's been voted on by the people. They've always been the legislature that's put it in place. And I think uh, if people in Indiana had to vote on a voucher system, maybe they would maybe actually look at it and look at the impact and the different issues and evaluate. It. Um, so. um, and it's grown exponentially in Indiana. And again, all this information is kind of covered in the, the video I shared with. And the highest number of people actually collecting vouchers now are people who are already in the public system. Um, we're going to spend a day in charter schools to kind of um, talk about them. Uh, we'll do that too. Um, I will mention one other quick, couple quick points. Um, teacher ed, uh, fast track programs are being popular in this time period, and things like Teach for America. And I think you guys should be concerned about them. Uh, I think great, there are great people who have done Teach for America. Um, the issue is. I think that it equates teaching with volunteerism, and it impacts supply and demand labor. Look, if, if you need more teachers, you should pay them more. Um, and instead, I think what a lot of states do is they look for programs like this to try to, um, you know, just create more people who are willing to teach. Um, um, alternatives to site-based management is something important to know. It's a new system. It can cause conflict. Um, but it, it's school level management by um, councils of teachers, administrators, and community members. This is an idea that I think would be I'd somewhere in, in Indiana. Um, the, um, you don't need to worry about the drugs and violence. I think linking these, though, has become a real problem. It's part of the school to prison pipeline. Um, and that happened in, in the last 30 years. And, and I hope that you know teachers and um, and I, I just like always mention that through the 20th century, you know, if you look at the barons of capitalism, Rockefeller and Carnegie, and they never saw anything bad with the public. They supported, look at all the things that has Carnegie and Rockefeller's name on it, public transportation, public libraries, public universities, public parks, um, all were supported by capitalists of that time period. They saw value in it. It's really only been the last 20 or 30 years where we've seen a shift um, to the idea of, you know, pu private good, public bad. And I think where that's particularly had a damaging impact is on our public education system. And I just think, you know, again, something we need to kind of stop and really think about um, and reconsider. So um, I'm going to end it here, and I, I hope it was somewhat helpful.